right, we are in the Community Development Standing Committee meeting for Tuesday, November 7th. Um, we're meeting on the traditional territory of Squamish Nation. Um, so we have agenda before us. Uh, we have a mover to for adoption of the agenda. Moved by Councillor Kent, seconded by Councillor Race. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. So uh, the next item on the <coughs> agenda is approval of the meeting minutes uh, from our previous meeting. Any errors or omissions in the meeting minutes? No? I have a mover for adoption of minutes. Uh, moved by Councillor Ray, second by Councillor Elliott. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Um, okay, so our first item of business today is our development projects update. So I'll turn it over to our Director of Community Planning. Thank you, Chair. Um, as you can see in the um, Agenda today, we've got, um, at the time of writing this, uh, or putting together this list, we have seven new development applications in Squamish. Um, we've got a few of these applications that are related to waterfront landing, uh, a couple of uh, developments downtown, uh, smaller scale, um, uh, a sizable development in the business park under the industrial one uh, zoning uh, at Commercial Way, as well as an application for a rezoning on the Chikai Fan for the Chikai Ranch. Um, so uh, the item that uh, we've called out here is the Chikai Ranch application um, because, um, as you probably know, there's a temporary use permit um, on that property for uh, holding special events. And so the property owners would like to formalize that more uh, through a rezoning process to essentially continue what they proposed and just looking at their application there's a few more um, uses are, are, are also included that we'd have to further review um, but we do have a policy on the Chica Fan right now that, that says no rezonings on on the Chica Fan until we have hazard mapping and um, we've developed a development policy for development processes however um, this could be looked at in two ways. One, in that it doesn't comply with our policy. Um, another aspect of this is if, if this proposal could be um, done in a way that doesn't require any permanent buildings or new facilities to be built, essentially just allowing the special events to continue, that this could be a, a good uh, long-term use for the property until the mitigation issue is um, established or is addressed on the Chikai Fan. So um, the reason why I have it is just looking for early comments from, uh, from Council. Okay, we have comments from Council Rates. Thank you, well, it, it, the TUP, I think, um, my recollection is only uh, about one or two years old. It's uh, two years old now, two years. It's, it's got one more year left. One more year, and then <clears throat> plus it has the possibility of a renewal yes. still. Yeah. So we could just carry on business as usual until we sorted out some of the other issues. That's another option. That's right. Mm -hmm. Is there a possibility to just um, consider when we determine, I don't want to prejudge when we would consider it, but considering just a portion of this, it's a very large lot. Yes, we and could I be split zone. take all of that out of And is any of this in agricultural industry? It's not. But we could, it could be done as a split zone, especially because most of the site is not suitable for uh, special lands anyways. It's too low. Any other comments or questions? <coughs> um, I'm sure you're aware of an email that came through from uh, Sunwolf recently about some of the events that go on out there. Yes. And their feelings on how that affects their property and their property value and their clientele. So we have, uh, I, I have seen that email. Um, other than that email, uh, we're not aware of any complaints that uh, have been made during these events. Um, so it's, uh, it, we are aware of the email, but it, it would be difficult for us to now go back and confirm whether um, TP conditions were upheld or not. But going forward, though, if we do extend the TUP again, we do a little more monitoring if we can, just to, to see if you know, what those volume levels are like or what the traffic effect is like on some of those things. Absolutely. 
absolutely. And we have done, we've done some monitoring. So when the larger events have happened, we've done um, a site visit during the event, uh, during the day, um, and have worked with the property owners uh, leading up to the event to make sure that they've got all the, the traffic management plan and uh, the waste management plan in place. Um, so we, there's been some monitoring. We could probably um, increase that. Yeah, I, I have had neighbors in the, in the area come up to me and say things about the events, and I keep telling them, submit your comments to the district because it's impossible for us to keep track of it yep. without them actually submitted. You can't just tell me I'm not here. I want to submit something. So, I have, but I have heard from other neighbors in the area concerned about the, the lateness of the, the noise predominantly. Thank you. Uh, just, uh, I guess, a comment. Um, I read the same email, uh, and one thing that occurred to me is um, I was thinking back to when we granted the TUP in the first place. Um, it, my recollection of it, my takeaway from it, was relatively modest events um, and kind of low noise, <coughs> etc. Not at all like the Squamish Valley Music Festival or anything of that nature. So either on the renewal of the TUP, if that's the way we decided to go, uh, or you know, rezoning, um, we might consider putting some limits on the size of the events. Uh, and I think about the, the, what's happening, our experience from the regional district, and part of this is set out by the ALR, the Agricultural Land Commission, with weddings, for example, on farms, non-farm uses. Um, and some of those are quite restrictive, about 150 or 200 people and so forth. Uh, that may not be the appropriate number for here. I'm not suggesting that. But just the concept of saying, yeah, <clears throat> but this is kind of in a neighborhood, uh, even though it's a bit rural, but it's still a neighborhood that's subject to noise. We're not off in the middle of nowhere. And so nothing larger than X number of people. And so I'll just kind of leave that thought out there because um, it, it seems to be going forward. One of these things is going to require some compromises somewhere. Um, and that may be one of the solutions. Comments on this particular proposal? Okay. <coughs> um, that's all I had uh, highlighted, and if there's any other questions about new or existing applications. Okay, I have Councillor Race and Mayor Hansen. Thank you, and I had two. Uh, one is with respect to um, the waterfront landing TUP. And I just wondered why we needed a TUP there, because we zoned the property. Um, could you explain that? Is this something that's outside the zone? So there is a TUP that council had recently approved for the sales center. Um, they have also applied for a development permit for that first phase for a development permit. That's the next one. That's the next yeah. one, yes. Yeah. Um, there is a good chance that that development permit might take a little uh, to uh, resolve all the form and character um, issues. So the applicants have also applied for a temporary permit for a model block that would be associated with this, um, with the sales center. And the intent is to connect the two so, so that they can start um, constructing those model blocks that are necessary to, to activate the sales center in advance of their DP uh, being issued. But it's permanent housing. Ultimately, it's per it ultimately, it's going to stay there. Yes, and they will be covered by the DP. They are taking a risk that if their uh, form and character uh, changes, um, that the model block will have to be redesigned after it's built. Uh, after it's built, yeah. Um, the other question I had was with respect to the, um, the mud zoning on Cleveland Avenue, three seven seven eight one Cleveland. And I was just trying to picture where that site is. And, and I guess my question was whether that mud zoning, in my mind at least, I've never sort of anticipated it might show up on Cleveland Avenue. It was sort of one of the muds is in the business park, and the other one was kind of in the sort of the light industrial slash residential area around Third Avenue. So I believe it's this property right here. Um, it's the very end of Cleveland. You are in um, south downtown area here. Uh, which is currently zoned industrial, and so 
in terms of the downtown neighborhood plan designations that would uh, mud to is a, is a good fit uh, for this area. So it's so oh, Vancouver it's south of Vancouver Street. It's south of Vancouver Street, that's gotcha. right. Okay. It's, it's this lot right here, I believe. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks. That explains it. I lost track. I think I have to have the events for now. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. I'll let you cancel this. No, I'm sorry. Um, I know we look the same. <laughs> <laughs> Quick question, I, I actually couldn't find it on here. Um, so the um, old recent company building on Pemberton. What's the vantage? Though. Vantage. It, when is it scheduled to be demolished? Have um, they made any applications to that effect? That's a good question. I'd have to get back to you to confirm uh, with our building department. Be nice. Um, that's for now. That's all right. Um, just more curiosity, you know, that we've got a MUD 1 and a MUD 2 application. Um, how are those going in terms of what we created there and our staff finding them easy to review or opponents finding it like they're able to meet the requirements that we're looking for there? Um, so the, with MUD 1, we have seen now, uh, we have a few um, either at pre-application stage or application stage uh, proposals. It seems to be going quite well. Um, you know, the both applications that we've seen put forward include the density bonus for rental housing. Um, so it's it's a little tricky zone for <coughs> developers to figure out because they haven't worked with anything like that in Spanish. Um, so we're helping them through it, but it seems to be going quite well. Um, yeah. In terms of MUD 2, uh, we haven't seen a DP application yet. So it's all been at this own level. Right. Yeah, thanks. Um, I just wondered where Salter's development on Cleveland is. It's not on here. Uh, the Pack West site? Yeah. It, it should be on here. Um, the application's been in for some time now. Um, Yeah, it's on the third page, 2017-25. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I know we, um, it's on the agenda as the last item today. is coming later this month. Um, I think it's coming on the 21st. 21st. Just curious why adoption took so long between the um, I th believe this the project or oh, there we go. We have the file manager here. Thank you. Um, it's not at third reading because we are waiting for the legal documents, the land development agreement, the flood covenant and a rail covenant to be completed by the applicant and sent back to us. So. Just curious. Just curious about um, at the bottom of the first page, uh, 2440, the boulevard. Uh, I know we spoke about this last month, uh, but I was just wondering if that had evolved at all. At the moment, it still shows um, a three lot subdivision um, and whether there's any other direction it might be going. Um, so it hasn't uh, advanced very far. We have looked at the land title and there is, uh, you're absolutely correct, there is something on the land title of that property that restricts the use of land uh, as well as subdivision. So we will, we're uh, in the process of exploring what the alternative options are that the applicant might have because it's a bit of a, it could be an issue for planning, uh, community planning, if we have these covenants in the highlands that essentially that could um, uh, negate any um, sub-area planning um, that the district might want to undertake. Um, 
you'll get advice from our own council, but, but I can tell you I've had experience with these, um, and there is a way to remove them. There's two ways to remove them. Um, typically, the parties to a covenant or a building scheme are the parties to that subdivision, or the lots that are in that subdivision. And it's not the whole highlands. The highlands would have been developed in pockets of 20, 30 units. And so it's kind of the neighborhood, if you like, the immediate neighborhood. So one way is to get everybody um, who is a party to that subdivision, every current owner, to consent to having it discharged. Um, practically impossible, uh, but not impossible, but almost impossible. The other way is a court application. I think it's under the Land Act. Um, and the grounds are typically that the covenant is obsolete uh, because the evolution of a neighborhood uh, has sort of outstripped where the covenant was. Um, that, I will warn you, notwithstanding the passage of time, some of these covenants are about 50 odd years old. That's a very steep test. And so it's kind of, um, it's a, perhaps a bigger discussion, um, not just with this property, but because these are all over the place. <coughs> uh, not just in the Highlands, they're all over the Valley Fed and so forth. Um, about how the district wants to deal with them. Uh, and let me suggest one way of dealing with them is to tell the applicant, go and get it discharged uh, before you come for a rezoning that conflicts with the existing covenant um, and leave it up to them. Now that's a bit of a hurdle for them. Uh, and it is a steep test, as I said, to get these things dis discharged. It's not easy. But otherwise, uh, either we go with the covenant, which we're not bound to do, uh, or we decide we're going to just go our own road and let it evolve and, and see how that falls out in the neighborhood and whether it sows discontent in the neighborhood or not, or whether somebody does apply for an injunction. Because what happens is people gang up. And I've seen, I saw this in, off Judd Road on Brackendale, for example. The whole block <coughs> kicked in money, hired one lawyer, and attacked it. <coughs> So trying to change. Um, so it is certainly a doable thing for people to attack these things, notwithstanding the fact it's a Supreme Court injunction that they're after. So I'll just leave that with you, just make that comment. I was just kind of curious what that, and they're all different, uh, as you probably know, but just different developers have different forms and so forth. So these things are, there is no um, kind of right standard. Yeah, absolutely. And that raises another question as well. I mean, are, are these, is this still occurring with new developments that are happening? Are we still seeing new developments being put in place? And you know, what, if anything, can we do as a district to discourage that practice or, you know, limit it to, you know, very, you know, maybe aesthetic qualities versus use and that kind of thing? Yeah, I think it's still occurring. Um, I think we're still seeing it at university um, heights, still happening with density. So I'm not sure if there's anything that we can do other than ignore the covenant, especially on some of these newer um, proposals, uh, because there isn't the property owner, you know, there, there aren't many property owners involved, and just looking at between, more of between developers and property owners. Whereas in places like the, uh, the Highlands or Valley Club, it's now you're looking at a, a number of property owners. Well, I was just going to say, they're now called building schemes, which is maybe a more familiar term. Um, and it just, the legislation changed like, somewhere, I think, in the early 90s. So it's restricted covenant in the older part of the Highlands. That's the way it's registered on title. But it's, it's more or less the same thing. But they're now called building schemes, and I can tell you, uh, up until the time I retired, they were absolutely going on new subdivisions. <clears throat> um, lots of applications, obviously, lots of work. Um, currently, maybe you could just, for everyone's reference, go over how or if we can prioritize these developments within the, or do they just get in the queue and they get worked on? I'm not seeing a lot of developers come forward with forward-thinking green buildings at all. We're not getting any sort of forward-thinking buildings. And so I wouldn't mind the committee and staff to think about how we might create criteria for prioritizing development applications. If they hit our transit goals, if they hit green building, you know. It, right now everything gets put in there, processed, and um, I almost want to create a way for these really top-notch 
development seal to jump the queue because they're hitting all these marks. Thoughts? Absolutely. We, and we've recently internally also um, have um, discussed this because we have so many applications and now that we have a lot of applications, you know, the timelines are, not, are, are extending as a result. Um, and people are, there seems to be a willingness to do more if, if the proposal could be processed quicker. Um, so it's something that we've recently discussed, but I think it needs, it, it definitely needs discussion at this table um, if we were going to do anything about it. Yeah, I, I'm definitely in favor of that. I mean, because it's kind of like it's an incentive that doesn't actually cost us anything. Um, and I would point out too that uh, I'd like to see a purpose built rental as part of one of those criteria. New West does that I know for sure. So I'm definitely in favor of uh, other attributes as far as pre building and you know, really progressive urban design. Absolutely. Um, I think we can make a pretty good case to the public why we should prioritize kinds of applications and get sort of a, a race to the top. <laughs> um, so on that note, if today we all said yes, let's do it, what would be the timeline on that? I think the next thing we would do is look at uh, creating a policy uh, so that we're transparent and it could be easily communicated to the uh, development community and then bringing it back for committee to review. I mean, with our workflow and everything right now, and it not being a priority, I mean, just, you know, this year or probably next year? I think, I mean, what we're talking about is just putting some structure and identifying some of the um, values um, and then figuring out, this, figuring out the scheme of how, you know, if we have five projects, um, how do we prioritize those? Um, so I think it could be done this year. Uh, I can't remember how many times I brought up permeable services and green roofs. We started working on a green, more greening up the bylaw a few years ago. And, you know, unless council all gets around and rallies around it, then it's something on the work list. But it's in the budget, isn't it? The subdivision and development, grading the subdivision and development. Control bylaw, yes. That sort of got postponed a little bit this year because of the staff. Well, I know we're working. I'm just saying that, you know. Well, permeable payment's permitted. But it's whether permitted, or not you yeah. want to incentivize it through yeah. prioritization, whether it's affordable housing, whether it's built rental, green buildings, be cautious we don't prioritize everything. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And then we, can't, uh, then we can't meet any of those targets. So would it be reasonable to think that perhaps staff might have, have the ability to put together a sort of a draft for us to look at by the next month? For the next CDC? Jason wants a Christmas present. <laughs> That's late December, not early December. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll have something prepared. I don't know that we'll have a finished policy, but yeah, like even I, if it's a list of potential prioritization. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking that sort of, you know, we could have a discussion and, and then, you know, have uh, something to actually, you know, go through and check it off and say, oh, yes, yeah, and get the full feedback and then, you know, in the new year, actually have a uh, policy ready for, uh, for adoption. Okay. And, and with the okay, step code, uh, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I support, I support that idea, and I'd, it would be interesting to see how this, after going through that grid and being sifted, would come back, and if you could kind of run it through in a, in a one through whatever uh, process, so we could see the hierarchy of how it looks, as to where they fall into those categories, whatever those parameters be that get laid out. It would be interesting to see how this then shakes out. Yeah, Councilor Pryor? Uh, yeah, just the, the, you know, that step code, Gary, that guys are working on will make changes when that comes through too. So. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, I, 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 think, um, I think there's a few things right after that. Council could make a motion, I think particularly on purpose-built mental. 
we can make a motion, prioritize for potential, goes to the top of the left. I think we could make that motion right today and you guys could work with that. I think a more comprehensive policy that um, articulates specific goals, and I agree, you can't do a kitchen sink in there because then you won't actually <laughs> prioritize anything. Um, but um, select a list, bring a list back. I think the harder part is going to be, be in implementation and actually um, articulating the benefit of <coughs> meeting our prioritization marks and how it will affect their positioning in the, in the queue. That'll be the harder part to communicate clearly. Um, but I, yeah, I think the first part of the conversation is what do we, what do we want to consider as priority qualifications? Okay, I have Councillor Race and Councillor Elliott. Yeah, it, <clears throat> I mean, the more I think about it, the more complicated it gets because um, one development shows up with five purpose development levels and the other one has six. Uh, and does that entitle them to be the top, etc.? cetera? Uh, or one has purpose built rentals and the other one is a green building and how do you rationalize those two? And what about a commercial building that wouldn't have the purpose built rentals but might have some other things? So it kind of leads you to a bit of a, I don't know, some kind of a matrix system, just a point system. Um, and so I welcome staff's thoughts on that as well, um, just to see how we kind of rationalize some of these things and put them in order. Yeah, and just, just uh, from my perspective, uh, for me, when it's purpose-built rental, I mean like an entire building, uh, as opposed to the, so to me, that would be the distinction. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree with the mayor that we need to keep it simple, but what, but I do think there's sort of, in the same way that we're looking at inclusionary zoning, what happens for smaller lots versus larger lots, I think that comes into play in this about what you're capable of accomplishing, but um, I sort of think if we look at our strategic plan in four broad areas, there's a point system under there, so economic development, healthy communities, environment, um, transparent government doesn't include really that, but, um, but it, you know, if we had sort of tick boxes under all of those, you know, does it further our active transportation, does it create healthy community? You know, if someone proposed a purely commercial building downtown, for me that would rise to the top because that would be ideal. Um, so I think some of them are no-brainers, like a purpose-built rental building rises to the top. Purely commercial, like another cornerstone building downtown, that would make sense to me in terms of economic development. Um, and, and then I think trying to move people towards building better homes that will be suitable or surpass the step code as it comes in and create a lower carbon footprint for our community in the long term is the other big one for me. Um, so affordability, economic development, and carbon footprint. I'm gonna, in a minute, we'll move on. Any other thoughts? Uh, any other questions about other developments that are on the list? Okay. Well, oh, <laughs> Councillor Kent. I would be remiss, right, if I don't touch upon the gateway. I see we're inching our way closer. We're at 75% <laughs> That's heartening. Uh, yes. Um, it hasn't been, um, hasn't been much development since the last CPC meeting. General question, because uh, I'm buying time for the mayor to finish her motion. But um, as, as we bring new members onto the ADP, do they get briefed on council's priorities and strategic plan? And, and I'm, I'm asking that because the, the minutes with the new members on it are in uh, our package tonight. And when I read through some of them, I thought, oh, I'm not sure that person understands some of the direction we're going. I mean, I don't know who said it, but I'm just wondering if they do get briefed or. They get a, a package of our bylaws. Um, they don't get briefed, and um, I think it's a great idea. And we intended to do that before their first meeting. Unfortunately, the agendas were so packed that 
uh, we just had to go with it. Um, but uh, we have done this last year where we had um, a kind of re refresher um, course with the ADP uh, to talk about the purpose and the role. And we could do that again um, in the new year to make sure that all the members are up to date. I think it's a great idea. I appreciate that. Like one comment that stood out for me was um, in regards to the um, Garibaldi, you know, the polygon proposal for the golf course. And, um, you know, council said all the way along that doesn't really like the road up the middle, but then you start seeing comments from the ADP again about needs more roads into the, into yes. the middle. Yes. Um, so I know that they have to catch up on the history, but. They do have to catch up on the history, and their role is to also provide that independent advice. Absolutely. Right? So it's, it's still valuable advice, but we, uh, we have to filter it through what we've heard to date from council and from the community. Well, that's great. I, I'm glad you brought that up. I think it would be nice if we had council meets the ADP sometime, you know, just for a 10 minutes where they are ask questions. But on that particular comment, I, I was kind of impressed with or interested when that comment came out. And I remember us discussing it, saying, we don't want this road here. But if you listen to the thinking of the group when they discussed that particular point, there was some validity to having that road there. That when you just read that comment, you go, well, we didn't want that. But if you want to listen to architects that, and urban planners and people that are in the business talking about the flow of the development and all these other things, I thought, when I heard that, I thought, well, I can remember Patty saying, I don't like that road going down there. And then I hear these guys go, well, actually, you know why it's good down there? And so I thought, that, that, is, that is a fault. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a bit of a fault or a lack of communication between the two groups. Because you know? we, as lay people, can say all sorts of things and make all sorts of ideas up. But then the, the, the design panel, to me, is the experts and pros in all this that we should somewhat be listening to, not, you know. Can I just that one? Mm -hmm. um, and I think by priorities, I mean, um, we put in place an active transportation plan. And so we're trying to prioritize bicycles over people. So then when you see a, a conversation develop that's about prioritizing roads and the flow of traffic through a development, all, all it the doesn't... Bike lanes. Lend, lend. So that's what I'm talking about, is that if council priority is to start prioritizing people and bikes, not easing the flow of traffic, then we're not quite on the same page, regardless of whether we're getting an independent opinion. And, and I think it's important that we keep our distance from the ADP so we do get that independent opinion. And, and it gives us food for thought. I'm just talking about sort of those broad priorities. And I think it would be great to be able to sort of say to the ADP, well, you might be prioritizing the flow of traffic. Please know that council will be prioritizing the flow of people and children and the 8 to 80 kind of scenario. That's what I'm talking about. So I'm yeah, talking about the um, broad picture. Yeah. 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 And, and those comments all work into that particular issue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I would say that probably, you know, having that sort of uh, introduction briefing kind of session uh, will help to, you know, give people a bit of the lay of the land, recognizing that, um, you know, we have members of the ADP who may not be as familiar with Squamish uh, just yet. Um, so definitely, I think that will help a little bit. Right. Um, yeah, um, years ago when I was on the ADP, we talked about uh, the ADP doing yearly awards or acknowledging sort of the best of what they've seen in the year. And I, I think it's come up over the years, but it's never actually happened. I'm wondering if we could task the ADP with, with creating like the ADP top three award. So we acknowledge the really good stuff that's going on and provide a little incentive I think it's a great idea. I think it's a fun exercise for sure. Yeah. We could look at, at the beginning of uh, next year, we could look at all the projects that came in in 2017. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I agree. Anyway. Next year. Just a few months. A year away is year from today. No, no, in January. You're talking about January. 2017. Yes. Yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we have a motion. Uh, the motion is that staff bring to the December 
uh, Community Development Committee meeting, a framework for prioritization of development projects, and that in the meantime, 100% purpose-built rental buildings be given top priority. I'll move, that. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll move it. Seconded by Mayor Anderson. Any discussion? See Doug smiling back there. <laughs> I might, I might build a couple of them. Excellent. <laughs> right on. Okay, well, uh, I think we did kind of hash this over pretty well, so call for a vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. All right, so uh, I think we'll move on to our next item, which is a short term rentals update. Welcome, Thanks. Asia. I'm just going to upload the presentation. Good afternoon, Chair and Committee members. My name is Asia Phil, Planner with the Community Planning Department, and we're here today to provide a quick update on the short-term rentals in Squamish, and then to have a discussion on whether we should be directing resources to further explore the regulation of short-term rentals in our community. So I'll start with a short introduction and then dive into the short-term rental trends in BC, and then a snapshot of rentals in Squamish, then we'll look at the overall pros and cons to regulating short-term rentals before getting into a discussion on where to go from here. Just like put out that income is monthly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I'm sure most of us with, are familiar with short-term rental platforms such as Airbnb and VRBO by now, um, but I thought I'd include a quick description. So typically, short-term rental is defined as the practice of renting out a room, a secondary suite, or a whole home, or any other type of dwelling unit for a short-term stay, usually for periods of less than 30 days. The last council discussion around short-term rentals took place about a year ago at this committee meeting, uh, where it was indicated that the discussion should be picked back up following the Housing Task Force report and also an examination of Vancouver's short-term rental regulation process. So the Housing Task Force report outlines 13 recommendations, one of which is to develop policy and resource adequate enforcement of the growing proliferation of short-term or vacation rentals. And the City of Vancouver very recently hosted public hearings on their proposed short-term rental regulations, and a discussion and a decision is to be made by their council on November 14th. So from a quick scan of other BC municipalities, there's at least 10 local governments that are either in process or have approved short-term rental regulations. The regulatory approaches range very widely from permissive to restrictive and everywhere in between. Vancouver's current proposal is to allow short-term rentals in principal residences with a business license. They are proposing that secondary homes, illegal suites, and investment properties not be allowed to do short-term rentals. Nelson has taken a more permissive approach. They're allowing principal and second homes to be rented, but they've set a cap on the number of licenses that are issued. And Whistler has taken a much more restrictive approach. Most residences there, regardless of whether they're principal or second homes, are not allowed to provide short-term rentals for any length of time. You can see that it, it ranges very widely. So here's a quick actual screenshot of the Airbnb website that I took this morning, and it shows that there's over 300 short-term rental units available in Squamish. So staff have been informally monitoring the number of short-term rental units through Airbnb tracking since May of 2016. We haven't monitored any other platforms because Airbnb currently makes up the lion's share of the short-term rental listings. And then starting in October of this year, we've been using a third-party short-term rental um, trend monitoring service, and they've been providing us with additional data that we weren't able to track on our own. So as of today, and this is from this third-party service, there are 356 listings <coughs> in Squamish and 290 unique properties that fit the definition of short-term rental. 
73% of these listings are entire homes, so as opposed to a private room in someone's home. The map on the right-hand side highlights the approximate lo locations of short-term rentals in Squamish, and these appear to be spread pretty evenly throughout the community, and they don't seem to be confi confined to a specific neighborhood. Can I have a clarity on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 73% uh, of 256? Of 290. Of 290 are the entire homes. Yes. Rentable on the could this, so as, a, could this, as opposed to renting a private room is the other portion. Right, so a lot of them are a whole home. The majority of them are entire, somebody's entire home. Uh, does that include uh, secondary suites? So if somebody had a carriage house, that would be treated probably the same as the entire home. So home isn't defined as like a single family dwelling unit here. It would be an entire whatever type of unit, be it suite, carriage house. So. Can I follow up on that question? Um, would we presume then that nobody's living in that house on a regular basis? That is, it's an investment property? We can't assume that specifically because we don't know the length that they're, how often they're renting it out. So if I owned a house and I went away for a month vacation and I Airbnb'd it during that time, I would be included in that figure, but I actually do live in that home. So we don't know the exact number that would be, you know, taken off the market for long-term rental, basically. So in the past year and a half of this uh, informal tracking, the number of Airbnb units has almost doubled. So we started with 170 units in May of 2016, and we're now up to, um, through our informal tracking, 320 units in October of this year. And this trend for a 50% annual growth in short-term rental units is very consistent with what we're seeing across Canada. <clears throat> so the long-term rental market has become very challenging for those who are looking to rent in Squamish right now. According to CMHC rental market analysis, the vacancy rate in Squamish was 0% in 2016. The 2017 information is yet to be published, but I think anecdotally, it doesn't appear that the long-term rental market has improved over this time. And I think most of us would probably agree with that. The 2016 census data shows that 27% of Squamish households are renters, and that 36% of these renters spend over 30% of their income on housing costs. So short-term rentals have the potential to negatively impact the supply and rental rates of long-term rental housing, which could have impacts on the retention and recruitment of labor and employees over time, and on a broader level, have economic and impacts to business growth in Squamish. The development of STR regulations would require very significant staff time to develop and ongoing staff time to enforce, and other jurisdictions that we've met with um, who are dealing with these STR issues have spent very significant resources on developing regulations and enforcing them. But on the flip side, there's also many benefits to regulating short-term rentals, including the protection of our long-term rental supply, ensuring a good neighborhood fit, enabling supplemental income for homeowners and, uh, and residents, and insurance, ensuring safety. And so on that note, we're seeking direction on whether staff resources should be allocated to further explore the potential regulation of short-term rentals in Squamish. And I'll leave it at that to start the discussion. Thank you. Councilor Pratt. Um, so in you know, the building department, the uh, permitting fees and all that kind of cover staff, I just would, if we move forward in some kind of regulation on this, could not the fees cover staff time? Uh, right now, the, so this year, um, our building and planning fees uh, pretty much cover off the building planning um, service. Um, but we have, we, we have other policy projects for 2018 that, that you know, we projected to be working on, like the zoning bylaw update, implementation of the OCP. So this would probably be an additional uh, drain or strain on, on resources. By additional income to not quite cover the cost or? Uh, well, I'm not sure if we could get additional income. 
No, I mean, it's perfectly possible to set a business license or a particular permit at the rate that council deems if they want it to cost for cover. That's, that's possible. It's possible, yeah. So I, I did a little bit of research into what Vancouver is doing right now. And they did some ground truthing in trying to estimate what it would cost them to roll up their short-term rental program. And they were thinking that they would run a, a deficit until like around 2020. So the first few years of program would run a deficit. Um, and that was under the assumption that, that they would have fairly low compliance thinking people are not just going to jump to be like, oh, I need to get a business license now to do this. And I'm wondering, um, in your research, uh, what did the other jurisdictions find in terms of um, being able to work uh, with Airbnb to get data from them and also things around, like, you know, taxation, right? Because recognizing, of course, that... Uh, you know, they are competing with uh, hotel rooms and other accommodations that have to pay into the, uh, the, the visitor's tax. And are, have any jurisdictions successfully uh, tapped into that revenue stream? And then also having the data, because that's the key thing as far as compliance is if you know where these units are, right? And, and really being able to uh, monitor that way. So. So most of this is anecdotally just from whatever research that I've done, but it sounds like Airbnb is not typically very favorable to producing specific data. They'll do aggregate data where you can't pinpoint a specific unit in a specific location, but they'll give you data on the whole. Um, and in terms of taxation, I think they also haven't been forth very forthcoming about proactively saying they'll collect that on behalf and distribute it to the municipality or to at the provincial level. Quebec, I think, has been um, the only province so far that's um, worked with Airbnb to put through a uh, tax on these. Yeah, my understanding uh, is San Francisco was sort of the leader on this. Um, New York's done a lot in Paris, so we haven't looked outside of Canada for some of the guidance on this, which I think might be a good idea. I kind of like where Vancouver's going with theirs, um, in that I can see it's a reasonable sort of middle ground. Um, and it would be great, I mean, if, and it's not just Airbnb, it's the RBO and maybe there's others, um, if, if there actually is a registry that you, in order to list on Airbnb, like we don't necessarily need their data. <laughs> But in order for them to qualify an Airbnb, they need a, a, a license and a certification from the city. And I think that Airbnb and others are negotiating that with other cities. I'm not sure if anyone's actually achieved that yet, but wouldn't necessarily, we wouldn't need the data. They just simply wouldn't allow them to go on unless they got approved their certification with the city. Um, it's one of those things, it's going to cost us a bit of money to do this, but it, it has a detrimental effect on our rental market. And until we get more purpose-built rental buildings, um, the you know secondary suites and shared accommodation is a key form of, of low, lower income, more affordable units in town. That's just the reality of our housing stock. So in my mind, it, 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 it's worth spending a little money to do that. Um, and not seeing a return for a couple years, that may be the case, but it's a pretty critical issue. Um, Councillor Reese. Oh, well, I've got a number of thoughts, but just on the taxation issue, um, because we had this discussion in the regional district, same issue, um, and Whistler, and it wasn't the municipality, but uh, all of those um, um, cell phone condos that are part of hotels and rental pools and so forth were reassessed, I think going back in the late 80s or 90s, and it was BC Assessment that took on the challenge of reassessing them, and they were assessed as commercial as opposed to residential, uh, which inevitably meant uh, higher taxation just because the commercial tax levels were higher. Um, and they looked at them as being hotel rooms, not residential, uh, and their definition of residential was 30 days or longer, or, or ownership. Um, so it's an assessment authority, and they haven't 
from my knowledge of the media reports and stuff, they haven't seemed to take wanted to take any particular steps in this regard of going after these people and take a house in the Highlands, for example, and, and reassessing it if it's an Airbnb uh, for at least partially commercial, and that would adjust their taxation. I'm not sure we as a municipality, um, unless we sort of say, now you're a B&B and create a separate class for them or try and deal with them in a different way like that, um, have any power that way. Uh, to me, it's a failing of BC assessment to, to go after these things and re reclassify some of these things that are being, um, uh, in effect, operated like a, like a one or two room hotel. <clears throat> I have a other comment. I'll wait until the discussion is done. Okay. Well, it was kind of the point. I was, you know, the business licenses, um, you know, for example, I take my home and rent it out four days a week for 500 a night. That's 8000 a month. And I don't pay any higher property taxes. And I assume in most cases that's cash money. It's taxable income. Well, or cash. People don't declare it. No, it's taxable income. Yeah. You're not talking about yourself, are you? <laughs> no, but I looked into it. I mean, or everybody's talking about it. Metaphorical. Yeah, no, but I did look into it. I suspect I some people do not declare it. Yeah. And so, you know, and I'm thinking that the business licenses <laughs> is also cost recovery if we get to charge more taxes on a house that's an Airbnb. Instead of the five thousand a year, we get ten thousand a year. That would be a bit of cost recovery. Before. And the other thing is insurance. I mean, I, I would like to know. I, mean, I don't know staff might have to answer this, but if someone opens up an Airbnb. Does their insurance company have to be alerted? And I don't really have a clue. <laughs> But you know Vancouver did originally have that you had to prove you had insurance yeah. and they actually dropped that out of their regulation. I don't know the rationale for that though. Airbnb has its own insurance. Yeah. Oh, they have their own insurance? Mm -hmm. and, and no, I don't think your private insurance policy would cover a commercial use. I mean, they typically have commercial use disqualifiers mm -hmm. or qualifiers as to what you can get. Councillor Elliott, Councillor Tandon, and I have a comment from the audience. Um, so I think what I heard from staff, maybe I'm wrong, is that if we want to tackle this in the coming year, we're going to be talking about it in budget. Because it didn't sound like there was capacity. Um, so that's my first question, is if we want to move this forward, are we talking about possibly hiring a contractor to do this, like we have done with Lacola, or, um, or do we need to give something up in terms of of priorities to do that. So that's my first question. I think to answer that question, we'd have to take a further look at um, what costs could be recoverable in, in the beginning. Um, because we're not really concerned with putting together the regulation so much as to enforcing it. Mm -hmm. uh, so we could look at, you know, with low, low compliance rates, what costs we could be recovering in year one and year two. And then maybe the the, the enforcement scheme could be low enforcement in the beginning until we have higher subscription rates. Um, but it would very likely be a budget item as well. So just to follow up, one of the things I'm curious about is the Sunshine Coast approach of, of taking a deposit. Because then if bylaw is called because there's a complaint or other services, then you draw down from the deposit. But how do you collect that deposit? So that's one of the things that I'm curious about. Um, and I think, too, for council, we should think about what we need to do to lobby the province in terms of changing the rules for BC assessment or requiring certain things from Airbnb to operate in, in this province. And I think we should be thinking about that for next um, uh, UMBC, UBCM, sorry, <laughs> for medical blank. <laughs> um, UBCM. Uh, so there's probably a multi-pronged approach because I think, again, the province has a role to play in helping municipalities um, protect their long-term rental stock. And without us becoming the enemy to um, homeowners, I mean, I get why a lot of people are doing this. It's quite lucrative. Um, a lot of people are 
continue to pay their mortgages because they're doing Airbnb. The problem is we're losing staff um, and people are moving away because they can't find them in so it's, it's trying to find that balance. But I do agree with staff, our biggest problem is with pay enforcement. And we have two and a half bylaw officers right now. So. <laughs> it's not enough if we're going to do this. Yes, we can't. Oh, I just uh, wanted to touch on something Gary said about the, about the insurance on the, uh, on the units and not being compliant if you had, were renting it out. Apparently there was a, a case in Vancouver Island and uh, Mount Washington where they got cleaned out. The operator was on site and all the furnishings were removed from the house. The place was trashed, but everything was taken out of it. Literally, like it was a before and after photo and it was quite a nicely appointed suite and afterwards the owner walked in. So that sort of lends some credo to your upper end of the spectrum there where should be on site. Avoid it. Oh, yes. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, third day from. You have to sit down. Oh, sorry. Because there's a microphone. Oh, I see. Third day from Squamish and Vancouver. I, I'll just give you a little update from a landlord's perspective. Uh, it's sort of a disturbing trend that I, I think is. I, through circumstances, I've ended up owning six houses at University Heights over the years. They were built in the market. It was not great sometimes, so I'd rent them out. And some of these houses I've had, now had for seven years. And the tenants turn over very infrequently. But this last tenant that um, I had uh, left, and I put an ad in Craigslist, I must have had 20 or 30 inquiries to lease this house. And it became a very awkward situation to be, and I do it myself, I don't know why, I just don't like dealing with rental agents. Uh, so I have all a slew of applicants. Through this process, I learned the reason why it's almost impossible to rent a house here and in Whistler is because of air. So there will be indeed some we're talking about. And so it's not an Uber tap, uh, that's another issue. Uh, Airbnb, because people are going for the short-term rentals. So I think it has a terrible impact from that point of view. And um, I don't know what the heck can be done about it. But it's, uh, and I don't know why on earth anybody owned a house would want to subject it to the abuse of all these turnover of Airbnb people. Anyway, the tenant that I ended up choosing was an executive from Bale Corporation who is moving here uh, to help run Whistler, I guess they own Whistler or something. Uh, he said the cheapest house you could find in Whistler was $7,000 a month. Uh, and the reason why all of the Whistler houses, interesting, are now being, not all of them, are, not just Airbnb, but they're being rented up by the um, the companies, you know, restaurants and whoever that own businesses there, and they're they're turning them into little hotels, little youth hostels or employment hostels. So it's, and the other thing with this Airbnb thing, is sort of screwing the hotel owners, mm -hmm. paying lots of taxes. And actually, I own a hotel, you know, at the executive suite. So I, I'm not really against Airbnb, but I, don't, I think it's a real conundrum how you how you fix it. But it's kind of sad that nobody. Can rent a house in Swamp. Really. Mm -hmm. That's the way it is. I think you can encourage, encourage more uh, rental, encourage more new rental buildings to be built. And you've already just passed the resolution to that effect? We have. Okay. Great, thank you. Councilor Reese. Thank you. Uh, I guess um, the bottom line is I don't think we have any choice um, but to move against them in some form. And the reason I say that is because it just conflicts with two of our prime initiatives for my last couple of terms on council. One is uh, the creation of more secondary suites, uh, and the second is uh, the affordable housing and market housing and, and, and market rentals uh, that we're now insisting uh, be in some developments. Uh, and that just gets frustrated. Uh, we're trying to create rental, purpose-built rental, and that gets frustrated by uh, Airbnb. And so I think we don't have any choice. I think we just have to budget for it. I think we have to set some significant fines for it. And I think we have to be prepared to um, move against some people to set examples. 
um, and publicize it widely and hopefully get compliance that way because I don't think people will comply. There's too much money in it. They will not readily uh, give up a cash flow like that unless they know that we're prepared to take steps against it. The other um, issue is when we're setting this, and I've been following uh, at least the Vancouver media with this, uh, and so the question is whether or not, um, you know, if you have somebody, the owner of the house uh, on the site living there when the person rents the, the room, whether it's just a spare bedroom, that's one thing. Um, so that's probably not something that would ever be subject to a long-term rental except in few isolated circumstances, or whether within the same four walls of the building you have a, a legal secondary suite, and that's what's rented out. Um, and so the person is still on site, still in the building, but does that count? Because now you've lost a clear long-term, potential long-term rental unit. So I think we have to be careful when we're distinguishing between the two. Um, certainly, the person on site, um, the owner on site aspect of it helps uh, when you're talking about neighborhood parties late at night, etc., and all the abuses that can come from that. Um, you still have to deal with um, increased traffic, but it's a, a lesser thing. But I think the real problem uh, is with our loss of rental stock. Uh, and What's the point of us going through all these steps when all we're doing is creating a bunch of hotel rooms? I mean, there just is no point uh, for what we're doing unless we're prepared to ensure that they actually become rental units. So I think it's a bullet we're just going to have to bite. Uh, and it will cost us money, I have no doubt. We can recover it with fines, business <coughs> licenses, compliance, all of the other tools that are out there. Uh, but I think we really have to take steps in that regard. I'm quite amazed at some of those numbers, to be frank. Uh, but um, so be it. <clears throat> so listening to um, Council Race, it dawned on me: are, are we still waiving fees to build secondary suites? Yes. Do we know if any of the people that have taken advantage of that have turned their secondary suites into Airbnb? We don't know the locations. We don't, we don't know. We suspect that that's, some secondary suites are being rented as Airbnbs by the looks of the pictures, but so we can't confirm it. Is there a way to <coughs> structure our waiving um, of fees to put a covenant on that property that it can't be used as a short-term rental? Is there any way we can do that? It's only no. Not any fees. And, and further to that, I'm also wondering with um, new developments, particularly ones where you know you have a strata and all of that, like, is there a way that we can have some sort of uh, restriction on, on short-term rentals? Have any local governments taken that additional step when uh, at the rezoning stage to, to just say, like, this is not a permitted use? It's possible, uh, but again, it would, um, we rely on complaints uh, when it comes to enforcement. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we've been getting some complaints, but not a whole lot about Airbnbs. It's kind of a steady, um, steady uh, stream, but it's not overwhelming. So I think some stratas, maybe the practice is wide, wider spread than others, and people tolerate it. But it, again, enforcement would be tricky, even if we had a covenant on title. That's right. Yeah. I think my recollection is all of our residential zonings areas don't permit short-term rentals. I don't think we have any to do. Rural, rural residents would have Airbnbs. Okay, but I know in the report there's some municipalities that are changing bylaws because some of their bylaws permit it in some zones, but I don't think that's the same case in Squamish. It's 30 days or longer. Uh, whether it's a strata, single family, townhouse, apartment, I don't think it matters. So we already have the tools. It's just a matter of, of enforcing it. Yeah, um, I agree with Council Race. I think, I think we need to do something. <coughs> um, I think we need to sort of plot it out and budget for it next year. Um, and I, I, I would encourage you to look at San Francisco. Um, just some of the things they have is I don't, you can't do any more than 90 days. You have to live in your home. It has to be primary residence. You have to live in the home for 275 days out of the year. Um, you have to inform your owner, your tenant. You have to uh, register. You have to pay a hotel tax. 
Um, there's a whole bunch of Airbnb has to notify their clients of the local rules. And um, so it, it's a, it seems to be a really good one. And they tried to ban it. And it's just unmanageable and people just go underground. So, um, and I, you know, I do understand the, particularly in situations where you may have um, in-laws that stay there for six months out of the year and then you have an empty suite, but you don't want to rent it out permanently because your in-laws go back and you have always have somewhere for family to stay. So I understand the motivation to do Airbnb in some situations, but it's just, it's run rampant without any rules. Um, and it really has affected our affordability. So that seems to be the most mature and most tested sort of approach, San Francisco. I think Paris has a pretty good one too. I'm not as familiar with that. But. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I'm always not through. Well, I was going to move a motion that we refer um, regulation of short-term rentals to the budget and the staff bring back a proposal for how we would put in place regulations in 2018. Seconded by Council Race. Any further discussion? Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Moving on to our next item. I have, I have a post motion question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, my understanding is for, for bed and breakfast in general, you have to get a business license and you have to get a building inspection. I know when I stayed in Seattle, we did an Airbnb, um, and they allow it to a certain extent. Um, but we stayed in this camper in somebody's backyard. So how do you how do you, how do you building respect for you know some people are staying in yurts or some people are staying in tents? Like how do you inspect for all these things? And do you want to? You know, mm -hmm. do we really want to? care that someone's staying in a trailer or a yurt or a pen? Well, if we're licensing the use, um, so the reason why I inspect it is to make sure that it meets the occupancy levels and the code. Uh, if someone's staying in a trailer, you know, it's likely that they wouldn't meet the BC building code. Uh, yurts can, there are structures, temporary structures that totally can meet the code and then there's others that uh, we can't confirm whether they're safe. Uh, so I think because we are in the position of licensing them, it's something that we should probably uh, The trailer doesn't mean it, it's a transportation regulated, not BC building code. So if it meets the transportation regulation, so like I'm just trying to Yeah, like if it's an RV, um, we can certainly take a look at that through the regulation. Uh, but there are other trailers that are don't, they don't the home built, um, let's say. You know, they, they don't subscribe to any standard. Well, we can we could look yeah, into something that curiosity. does have a standard to it. Because I think one of the benefits of uh, a Airbnb type thing is that it does give diversity of options for visitors. Um, and this might be the type of thing that, you know, is something people are looking for, something a little different than a generic room. And a, Absolutely. Staying so on a boat. I think that you can't get in a hotel room. So that's staying on a boat for, yeah, maybe. <clears throat> anyway, so I just think that there's kind of an interesting piece there to the tourism side of things of, you know, this is can be a different experience than just getting a room somewhere. Absolutely. No, I'm not planning to rent out my trailer. <laughs> Ten, I'm not going to open a boat. What's that? Ten, can you <laughs> I just, you know, to staff's comment that we haven't had a lot of complaints, I think every time we hear about people not being able to find rental is a complaint about yeah. Airbnb and we should forget that. So. Sorry. And we, this conversation did come up when we did the uh, secondary suite, um, you know, incentivization. How do we ensure? And I was of the mind that even if we just had someone sign a promise, it might not be legal, but it's like there's a moral obligation that you're getting, you're waiving these fees, you're going to put it in the benchmark. That's our purpose, right? 
even if it's just a something they sign, just the, so it's in their mind. It could, it these could be. be. Yeah, oh, some way of, you know, I, I was of the mind if you wanted to waive it, then you, you get the fees back once you've proven that you've rented, you know, your place out for a year or something. Anyway, I think we have to be a little creative about how we ensure that we're not incentivizing Airbnb. It could be a declaration. We currently make people sign a declaration if they uh, are advertising a suite, but they're, let's say, not paying utilities. Um, so. <coughs> get them to confirm that it's not a, a secondary suite. It could be the same. We could just get them to do a declaration for a start. That would be the best start. Do you want a motion? No, we can deal with that. Okay. It's not deck. I'm in charge of the <laughs> <laughs> That's easy. I'm having a deck lawyer. <laughs> All right, I think we're ready to move on to our third item on the agenda. Voting for capital funding. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. So we have a handout for all committee members. Good afternoon again, Chair and members of Council. Again, my name is Asia Phelps, Planner with the Community Planning and Infrastructure Department. So today I'm presenting our second look at the Path West rezoning application. So just some quick background, the applicant submitted to rezone the former Path West site from CD37 to a new comprehensive development zone, something that would be based roughly off the C4 downtown commercial zone. The project was previously reviewed at the September 12th community development meeting where four different massing and siting options were presented and I've shown these here just to kind of revive our memories. The committee gave feedback on the massing as well as uh, heightened design options for the project and the applicant took these into consideration and now they are presenting their revised proposal today. So this new proposal is somewhat based off of the previous option two, which is a podium and tower typology. And so this is shown in the top diagram in orange. Two buildings are proposed. The north building has a two-story podium with a four-story tower for a total height of six stories. And it features a two-story commercial space fronting onto Main Street and Junction Park. And then the south building has a two-story podium with a six-story tower for a total height of eight stories, and it features a four-story office space that fronts onto Vancouver Street. So commercial use is provided at grade along the entire Cleveland Avenue frontage, as well as partially lining the mid-block pedestrian plaza through connection, and the two-story commercial building fronting Main Street incorporates a public rooftop patio, and the four-story office building on Vancouver Street has an angled shed roof and features a four-story wraparound patio. So the parking is at uh, the parking at grade or at level one is mostly hidden behind commercial or office uses, but it's still partially fronting uh, Loggers Lane. And then bike paddle uh, amenity spaces are proposed along Loggers Lane, as well as a landscape uh, screen, which they're calling Green Wall. The majority of the parking is actually contained in the second story parquet, which is shown on the level two plan, which is at the bottom of the screen. The mid-block through connection is lined with commercial units and is also proposed to be covered for weather protection. So some private open space is provided on the rooftop of the second story parquet, so this would be accessed via the third story. The level three plan also shows the public rooftop deck on the main street end. And then the level four plan highlights the office patio space. So that's on the left hand side of the screen at the bottom. So here's a view from, of the proposal looking south. This is from the perspective of someone standing just to the north and east of OCM Pavilion in Junction Park. And then this is the view eastward from the perspective of someone standing on the House Sound Group Pub's patio. And this final view looks eastward again, this time from the perspective of someone standing uh, on the corner of Main Street at Cleveland Avenue. 
So the applicant has also provided shadow studies based on the equinox, the proposal avoid shading Junction Park to the north of the site, and the proposed eight-story building also does not shade the west side of Cleveland Avenue. So I'll quickly present the following key comments from the September 12th Community Development Committee meeting and the corresponding response from the applicant to address these comments. It's a little bit hard to read, but I'll just uh, burn through it quickly. So the first comment was to provide variation in height and massing between the buildings. And so the response is that the height and massing are varied. You've got the six-story and then the eight-story building with the separation in between. The next comment was to apply special treatment and to highlight the Main Street and Vancouver Street ends. So that's being done through the two-story commercial building at the Main Street end and the four-story office building at the Vancouver Street end. The third comment was to activate the loggers lane side of the development and the applicant's response has been to add a bike and paddle amenity space and a green wall along loggers lane. And then the fourth comment was to provide activated open spaces throughout the development. The applicant's providing private open spaces on the roof of the second story, as well as that public rooftop patio and the public plaza in the mid-block through connection. And then the last comment was to step back the upper floors to provide visual interest and mitigate height impacts. And the residential towers are both step back um, to various degrees. Um, on various ends of the street. The towers themselves don't exhibit any further stepping back of the upper levels. So the following are staff's comments for further changes um, to ensure that these and architectural interests are addressed. So one, there's some concern around the viability of the bike and paddle amenity space to actually activate the loggers lane side. These spaces might function more successfully as dedicated spaces to community groups or as micro-commercial units, um, so we're proposing additional activation of Loggers Lane. And then secondly, further stepping back from the Vancouver Street End to ensure views from the brew pub and solar access maintain, uh, are maintained, we also feel is important. The Main Street End could also be stepped back further to increase the amount of open space at grade and to provide an additional buffer to the district's park lines. Thirdly, the public open spaces should be prioritized and activated and these should include the four corners of the site which are prominent opportunities for plazas or other public open spaces and also the rooftop patio fronting Main Street who feel should be fully accessible to the public and we're not sure how that, that will be achieved at the moment. And fourthly, as the design is refined, um, We'll also be reviewing further the stepping back of the residential floors from Cleveland Avenue to ensure that the height of these residential towers is sufficiently mitigated. And the tower roof lines, we also feel should be refined to ensure uh, more visual interest. And this could be achieved by stepping back the top floors of the towers or by applying an interesting roof form. So we're seeking uh, the Community Development Committee's comments and direction regarding the new proposal for the PAC West site. Following any further revisions that are based on the feedback that we received today, staff anticipate the next step will be to initiate the formal rezoning process and to bring <coughs> this project for initial readings. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Questions, comments? Councilor Fryer. Yeah, thanks. Um, I just looked in the package for the CD37 information, you know, what it is now, and I didn't see how many units and how high was allowed in there for the response CD zone. Was it six stories? I don't believe it was six stories, but I'll have to double check. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, curious. did you know? Three stories. Yeah, I Three stories. Four residential. Four stories residential? All residential. Yeah, because I remember when that zone was originally drafted, and I was just, so I was curious, and so I just wanted to know the scope of the changes. And then, you know, last, was I, I don't know, last Friday or the Friday before, we had the downtown Navy Herd gathering at the group up, and this project wasn't mentioned there, and I just wondered what happened there. I mean, you had 150 people in the room, it would have been a good chance to get a little bit of feedback. And 
The intent of that meeting was to well, cover the uh, proposed amendments that are applicable to the downtown core. So that's the 3rd Avenue, 2nd Avenue, Pemberton, the setbacks, the employment space. Yeah. And, and then we briefly touched on Cleveland Avenue uh, between Main Street and um, Pemberton, that section of it. So this wasn't included because it wasn't in that um, the, the downtown core Cleveland Avenue section of the update. Yeah, just, I just thought, I thought about it afterwards, but you know, of course I didn't bring it up then, but I thought we kind of missed an opportunity there. And then when you look back through, like, I'm just a little bit, <clears throat> you know, we've seen this once, and you know, like you mentioned, it's high rise compared to everything else in town. And I just th thought council would have more of a chance to get their head around high rise, you know, because you know I've asked a few times over the years, we got to pick where we want our high rises. And so, you know, I see this as moving rapidly from four to eight stories. Well, there are, there's other things that I wanted to discuss about increase in height, whether, you, you know, like what what benefits the community can get from that, you know, in the added, and, and even if, you know, the added height. Because I know in Vancouver, when you add stories, you give the community something. Okay, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, if I can just answer that uh, specific question about community amenity contributions, at this point, we're just looking at massing and the use of the building. We haven't looked at the uh, amenity proposal yet. So that would be coming next. Uh, the biggest uh, concern with the site was making sure that it doesn't um, overshadow um, the, the Cleveland Avenue and that those viewscapes are protected. Yeah, so that you have, so that's my point. Why wasn't it discussed at that, that meeting when we had everybody in the room? You're just asking us. Six or nine percent of you near here. Anyway, I just thought it was like, whoa, whoa, and then it's like eight stories up. And so I'm trying to get my head around all the opportunities for the district. And I, I, think I just felt like it was moving pretty fast. Okay, yep, I just. With all due respect, Council, I don't think that we should be doing development reviews, whether it's zoning or development permits, in a public engagement section about a rezoning. Well, it's not necessarily. No, we no, 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 just show and tell. I mean, we're getting it here. It was in the public meeting already once. We have a number of applications that are active downtown. I just don't think it's the right time or place during okay. the rezoning yeah, to bring okay. up somebody's individual application. I don't well, think that's I, the I wasn't time. thinking of individual applications, just height. Well, we will be talking about a very specific application, and yeah. I don't think it's appropriate to do that. Okay. All right. Because you know, we did talk about the other lots, and when we're talking about Cleveland Avenue from Main Street North, we're talking exactly about it. That's what we were talking about in that meeting. It was height on all those properties. I just didn't. I just wondered why it didn't go down to Vancouver Street, since we have a, a high building, highest in town, proposed 60 feet away. I just, you know, and I just thought, and it was after, I didn't think about it there, I just thought about it after, I thought, well, maybe that was a missed opportunity, I don't know. So the purpose of that meeting, I just want to reiterate, was about the small lots on Cleveland, as well as that historical stretch of Cleveland Avenue, yeah. which um, currently ends at Main Street. Yeah. Uh, just on that, and then I have another question. Um, uh, we did say quite a while ago now that we would look at this site and the uh, dating site down at uh, Winnipeg in Cleveland as sort of test cases that we would come in and to figure out that down that Cleveland Street vernacular because they both have to go through these zones. That's right. Uh, unlike some of the other ones which have the zoning ready, you might just need a DP. So that's a little bit of this was going to go through a test case lens. And I guess that's what we're doing. So um, I'm just looking at the existing zoning. Um, the height is 13.7 meters, which is, I guess, up to four feet. The um, FAR is one, 
and lot coverage is not to exceed 40 percent. How does this new proposal compare in terms of uh, FAR to the existing zone? Uh, I don't have the FAR calculation in front of me. Um, I'm not sure if Andreas can produce that. If not, I can quickly run it. I do have it. It will certainly be higher than one, and the lot coverage will be higher than 4%, absolutely. I believe it was around 2.4, but I'm not. Yeah, we, we can answer that. Yeah, just, just to help Council Fire understand the change in the zone, and everyone else. Just quickly to break it down between the three sections. So it's uh, for residential, it's 1.75. Uh, the retail is 0.35 and the office is 0 0.28. For a total of 2.38. Thank you. And we currently don't have any buildings even close to that FAR, do we? Um, well, the main's gonna be exceeding that. Uh, I think the main FAR is 2.6 or 2.5, um, which is coming on the other side of Cleveland Avenue. Um, and the Lauren is exceeding that, I believe. I don't know. I don't know. Um, the old Mountain FM building that just got yeah. demoed. Yes. All right, Council, any other questions? I have a question from the audience, but I'll just give the Council one round chance here. Thank you. And, and I'm just. Um, the public space on top of the two-story building at Main Street, um, I mean, is that public, like the park across the street, somebody can wander through at 3 in the morning and stop and have a cigarette and a conversation? Or is it kind of public during daylight hours only or during business hours only? Or And the reason I say that is I'm just more thinking about uh, the residential, talking about a proposal to have residential right adjacent to it. Um, and how livable those residential spaces might be if it was kind of a, an after-hours hangout or something of that nature. So through the chair, we haven't gotten to that level of detail yet. Um, those kind of discussions will definitely have with the applicant once we get some broader consensus that uh, we're ready to move towards for these. But yes, that definitely should get worked out in advance. Okay. And the other was the, the issue about animating Loggers Lane and, um, and I know this came up the last time, and I looked at this proposal, and uh, I sort of share staff's concern about, you know, bicycle rack and kayak storage. I'm not sure exactly how that animates it. Um, the difficulty I have with that is, um, you know, as a council, we've kind of made a decision to turn it into a truck route. I mean, we've really almost, in my mind, made it a lane in the true sense of the word. Uh, it will be now, all the way up uh, Loggers Lane until you get to Pemberton, uh, the service entrance for all of the buildings at front on Cleveland Avenue uh, along there, uh, I just think that's almost unavoidable. Uh, it's very hard to develop four sides of a building uh, fully because um, we can't access it by tunnel or helicopter or something like that. So inevitably one side is going to be the service side of it. Uh, I'm just not sure what type of animation we could even contemplate. Uh, you know, we're talking about a sidewalk, possibly sitting areas on a sidewalk, a place for people to put their bikes. I guess they have to come and go from that. But is there anything else that, that uh, might go there? I mean, what types of things would, would animate it within the context of this development? So through the chair, I mean, the other ideas that we had had was that it would be, could be space that was dedicated to a community group to use in some form to activate, um, or more commercial space. But uh, yeah, we share your same concerns that uh, a storage for bikes or paddling might not really activate and create pedestrian life along that street. Yeah. Um, but you're correct in that it's uh, going to be one of the main thoroughfares to Oceanfront and the truck route, and so there'll be pretty heavy vehicle traffic on there in the future. And whether it's appropriate to try to activate it to the same extent as Cleveland is, is a tough question. And just to follow up on that, but I mean, if you tried to have 
a space for a non-profit of some kind. It doesn't depend on, on walking traffic, for example. Um, that inevitably would take away from the parking, would it not, the way it's designed? Is there some other way that it could be accommodated? Or does that mean they're going through a variance for parking? Or it's a, a trade-off. It, yeah. it, might, it might impact how many uh, residential units could be developed, so above the two-story parking. So same FAR, just fewer, bigger units, as opposed to a whole bunch of small units? In downtown, it's one uh, parking slot per unit, so it would probably affect the number of units. Regardless of the size? Regardless of the size, yes. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to, um, what we're suggesting is, is that, yes, we are recognizing that loggers Lane will be a major route there, but uh, I think completely, um, completely ignoring it as a kind of uh, part of the streetscape would be a, a miss. Um, those smaller commercial units could be more affordable as well, just again because of their location. So it just adds a little bit more, um, what's the right word? Um, a little bit more um, activation on Loggers Lane. strong feelings about the activation on Loggers Lane. I mean, the one that's furthest north, the bike paddle amenity, that's within walking distance of Honea Park, which might have a boat launch eventually, and so that might make sense to have, then we don't have to put it on our parkland. It's part of this building. So the one to the north sort of makes sense. Um, I know that we've got um, the loading zones and the garbage and recycling on the corners of the building just as you come out from the plaza. So to me, that's a miss, because if we want to activate Loggers Lane, I'd rather see those loading zones and the garbage and recycling moved somewhere else so that the, the corners of all ends of the buildings are activated with something. So I don't know if that's possible, but that, to me, sort of provides some activation on the Loggers Lane side um, without having to take away from parking. Um, So that would be one comment, is that we, we keep the commercials coming through the plaza area rather than it becoming a loading zone, which is a bit awkward if you want to sit and have a cup of coffee and then a big truck pulls out, beeps in backwards while you're sitting there. So I don't know if there's a place for that to go, but it, it, that didn't seem okay to me. But I'd rather, I think, see most of Waters Lane activated by something visually interesting rather than commercial space. Uh, and, I, and I think part of the amenity package that should go with this is about creating those spaces for things we need in the community. And whether that happens in part of the commercial space or somewhere else in the building, I don't know. But I'm not sure that it belongs so long. I'm Julie Breziak. I live in the um, Studio SQ at 37841 Cleveland. And actually, I hadn't intended to make a comment about this. I just decided to sit, to stay and hear the presentation. Um, you're talking about preserving um, view lines. Uh, with eight stories, I, I can't see whose view lines are preserved. Certainly not the Studio SQ across the street. So uh, I'm just wondering about that. And also, I agree, if you don't want um, Loggers Lane to be a laneway, then don't put lane-type um, amenities like recycling and garbage and everything else in the back. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, I, I kind of concur with those comments, and I think this is emblematic of trying to squeeze too much density onto one site, um, because obviously if your FAR was smaller uh, and your, your density was smaller, you need less parking uh, and you might have some more space to pull back from the streetscape a little bit and do something more creative. Uh, I think people need to rem remember, for me anyway, I'm astonished by this is an entire block. It's a very long block. It's going the visual impact of, of buildings of that massing and that height is very significant. So, I don't know. I mean, I, I find this development very, very troubling. So, uh, 
um, and I don't know how you uh, rectify that without reducing the density because this is, it's true, this is one of the few blocks within the downtown core that does not have a lane way. And so yes, you do have definitely different challenges, but you also have different opportunities um, in terms of activation. Um, and what I'm seeing here is not very creative um, given the density that is trying to land on this, this one site. So that's just more of a comment. Um, I know staff is working, doing their best to work with the applicant to uh, achieve uh, you know, whatever possible objectives. But uh, as a member of council, I find this development very, very troubling. Um, yeah, more of a comment too. Um, it's in, I mean, this is obviously the very beginning of this process. Uh, lots of public input will come, I'm sure, um, which always informs a significant part of this, part of any application. So, um, you know, I, I, developers are going to put forward what they what they feel they want to put forward, and it's up to council to to decide either way. And of course, the community input is. Fundamental to that, um, I, I share generally what Councillor Blackmore was saying in terms of just trying to put too much on the site and compromising too much on water plane activation, uh, some sight lines. So I don't want to prescribe it, but it's generally <coughs> bloating out too much from my point of view at this point. Um, it'll be interesting to see what the public says about it, depending on what form it goes forward. Councillor Rice and then Councillor Elliott. Yeah, um, Councillor Elliott pointed out the, the loading zones adjacent to that through block plaza, and, and I hadn't noticed that, but the more I think about it, that is absolutely the wrong place for it, because it seemed to me that one of the signature pieces of this proposal uh, was the through block plaza, and the idea that just leads to kind of the garbage bins and loading zone is, is sort of not consistent with my vision of what it could be. So, uh, so definitely I would move those. Um, the other comment I'll make, um, you know, if we were shrinking density for myself, um, I'm not as concerned about height as I am about footprint. Uh, and I would shrink the footprint as opposed to the height. I'm fine with the height. Uh, as I said it before, I want to be able to see through the development, uh, just like the, uh, the member of the public just made a comment about and uh, so if we were going to reduce density at all, um, it doesn't necessarily mean drop a floor for me, uh, but shrink the footprint of, uh, of the residential units. I will make the comment that, that you know, the advantage of this is it provides significantly more commercial uh, than the previous proposal did, uh, which uh, was just entirely residential. So that by itself creates challenges. Uh, you know, the, the return is different and you know, it takes more parking, there's a whole bunch of features that go with that. And I think if we do want commercial, and we have said again and again, we want commercial, uh, we have to recognize that there is a cost to that, there is an impact to that, uh, that transfers into the residential. So there's a bit of give and take there, I think. Um, but, uh, but I am, as I say, more concerned about footprints, not height. Thank you. Councillor Elliott. I, I wonder, because the member of the talk about use case with staff to just clarify what we mean by use case because I don't think it means protecting the view for everybody but maybe you could sort of when, when we're doing use case studies what we're looking for and making that clear for the game yeah so definitely the priority is placed on views from the street and from our public um, parks and public pathways so in this case we did emphasize to the developer that the view should be maintained more from Junction Park and the main street as well as the Vancouver Street Inn, and sort of around that gathering spot that is the brew pub entrance and patio area. Thank you. Um, there it. Uh, and I think for me, moving that commercial all to one end, um, like Doug said, is important because I think that we get another sort of cornerstone like building and it creates a place, a commercial place. And I think. That was a really positive change. Um, I, I think I agree with um, 
my colleagues is that we might be trying to do too much on, on one site. Um, I think that, as I mentioned before, the whole loading garbage recycling is in the wrong place. Um, and, and I think our community is going to struggle with the height, and so maybe it needs, yeah, we need to think about that. Maybe it needs to be skinnier, so maybe it's not that it's eight stories, but it maybe it's too wide still, or the stepping back, because the massing is just giving us a very broad outline, it's, it's difficult to, to tell, but, um, but I think we're going to get a lot of public feedback on what it's currently proposed. Okay. Well, I'm just wondering in our planning documents, is there anything that helps us plan height? Do we have any documents that we still follow that plan height, like the 2000 plan, or I mean, which? Where's our guiding principles? So, uh, in terms of our the draft out on the plan and what informed that process. Um, the, really, the downtown neighborhood plan has um, four stories as so, sort of the upper limit of height in most places in the downtown core. And I believe that we that plan was informed or in part limited by the previous building code that related to wood frame construction. And I think we're now beyond that if we want to see density uh, in the downtown core. Um, we have already a number of applications that are at the six-story level. Um, so this was, um, uh, as the mayor mentioned, this was um, a bit of an exit, a feedback loop to see what is possible on the site without sacrificing uh, the viewscapes and the shading and the character of Cleveland Avenue. But in terms of other planning documents, we know that as you go south uh, onto the uh, the Oceanfront Peninsula, the the northern part of that peninsula is, actually goes up to 12 stories in the zoning bylaw. So it's not inappropriate to ramp up height at this end of town, um, but it has to be done uh, in a way that achieves the the objectives we have on Cleveland and downtown. So, so we're still we're not looking at the 2003 plan as far as that helping us with height, and I'm not. I'm, I'm more talking, you know, there's two things that concern me. And I know the eight-story buildings are coming, and I'm, I don't really want to fight that. Um, I want to make sure that when we go from a four-story zoned property to an eight-story zoned property, that the community gets the amenities for that. And the other thing is, it, it, anything that I ever read or anything that was ever written on height designated kind of a layout of height in the community. And so you talk about the 12-story, that was all part of it. Those 12-stories were part of that. And it talked about height and gradually getting lower toward the water. Okay. So, I mean, and I think that still stands. I don't think we've ever done any planning to change that. I think that was, and if you go to the 2003 plan, it talks about it, and, and I, I don't think we ever changed anything. I know we're letting in four-story and six-story, I mean, I know we're letting that in, but in some cases we're going against that, which was the last <coughs> policy that we had. So, I mean, I'm just, I'm just, you know, and I, like I say, I'm not going to fight eight stories, but I just want us to get a pound of flesh in amenities for that. You know, and I mean, I would like to make sure that we know if there is any documents saying where height should go, that we know that we're not following that policy. You know, and if you go, like I say, go back to the 2003 plan, see what it says about height, because that's still our guiding document. Are we clear about what the 2003 document is? Is that the is that the draft? That's that informed the draft downtown neighborhood plan. Yes, which yeah. which has a, it doesn't go uh, beyond uh, four stories, uh, in some areas six stories, yeah. but I think we are uh, in, in a different in a little bit of a different reality today than we were back in 2008 when the 
draft out of the plan was written? Yeah. Well, possibly, but I don't think in height we are. We still haven't figured out height. We're trying to figure it out all down to you know, I mean, I'm looking forward to figuring out height because I, I don't mind eight story buildings, but I just know they're coming. And I just, before I forget, and I'll go to Councilor mm -hmm. Kent, is um, I think the, the key thing to consider in this scenario is that um, Cleveland is our high street. And Cleveland is a very specific uh, area that, you know, one of the advantages of Cleveland in comparison with other commercial areas in town is the sort of, you know, the fine grain. Uh, and I understand that this site is one big site, uh, but keeping that going on Cleveland a little bit, I think that's really important. And I mean, if you think about, um, you know, the high streets and, and other communities, you know, eight stories is pretty high, you know, you know, other than maybe New York or something, most high streets, the, the height is usually, you know, you're looking for something six, you know, but it's usually quite, uh, quite step back. And, and the reason for that is that, you know, you, it is a place where people will congregate and spend more time. Um, and, you know, it's a little bit different. And the constraints in terms of space, I think, are, are such that, you know, you have to be careful, you know, in comparison with a master plan community like Oceanfront Development, where we kind of get to start from scratch. We've got to work within the, the confines of that. So that's sort of just my take on it. But um, yeah, just to touch on the height, um, I think, for me, I think eight stories has always been a bit of an issue, but, um, and I take Doug's point about the footprint as well, opening it up a little bit, maybe the courtyard a bit bigger. Um, for me, I know it's early days still, so the design, uh, there's some things that I do like quite a bit in it. Um, I do take Karen's point about the loading bays and stuff being at the end of the plaza. I, I think that, that could be located elsewhere and just keep that plaza strictly for the, um, you know, for its plaza uses. Um, and I also have a bit of an issue with the, with the blockiness. I know this is still sort of preliminary designs, but it's just, it's sort of like Lego blocks to me at this stage. And then I think there could be something maybe a little more creative done there. Um, I know we're going to get significant pushback, I'm sure, from the community on eight stories. Uh, I just have a feeling. Um, but another point to bring up, too, is that also this is a gateway piece to the ocean front, too. And, and in time, 10 years, 5 years, whatever it is going to be when we start building that and it starts to come up to meet this and vice versa, um, you're going to see taller buildings come in, in there. And so this is going to be commensurate with that as far as height goes. Um, so there's that to consider as well. Just drop them down. Right. Anybody else on council? I think we have another question, comment from the audience. Come on up. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Just, uh, we all uh, live in this community and we all want the best for it. And I think, and I don't want to lecture you in any way, shape, or form, but I think individually I've had discussions with some of you about the concept of going up, not out. So there is a, there is a, everybody can see that? That's a building taking up basically a huge chunk of footprint. And you can take that same building and put all the same square footage in there uh, by going up. And by going up, you also create huge open spaces on the ground with footprint, much less footprint. So I think if we're going to densify downtown, which is on just about everybody's top of everybody's agenda, focused development downtown or these huge things. I think we're going to have to join the rest of the world, which long ago figured out to go up on it, and just walk along the Coal Harbor waterfront from the Stanley Park right to the Convention Center. You've got these beautiful towers. I walk there all the time, and there's huge open spaces. It's unbelievable. You, you don't think about it if you're driving along Hastings or Pender. You get out of your car and you walk the seawall and you have 30, 40 story buildings, but you have acres and acres of open space. It's unbelievable. You've got to do it. And uh, I would recommend to each and every one of you council members uh, to make that trip. Park your car and walk along that waterfront. Yeah, yeah, you say you're laughing. And no, no, we <laughs> stayed at the West Hotel. Yeah, well, I know. Yeah, we we every, every day. Every day. Okay, so <laughs> well, then you know what I'm getting at. And you know this huge park space 
there. But you can only have it if you go up. And so, you know, people say, oh, I, I mean, not to make shots at any comments, but I say, oh, the eight stories, oh my goodness, what's, what's going to happen? We're going to get some public feedback. You've got, in Port Moody, you've got dozens of towers along the waterfront. In Port Moody, in North Vancouver, all over the place. Get in an airplane. Next time you fly into Vancouver, look out the window. There must be, and I'm not exaggerating, a thousand towers from Surrey to uh, West Point Grey. Thousands of them. Uh, we've got to kind of join the real world if we're going to have a, a community that people can afford to live in. We've got to create space. Anyway, there you go. Go up and that. I think that stimulates some questions and comments. Uh, Mayor Heinzman and Councillor Elliott. Yeah, uh, just to clarify, I'm not as concerned about the height as I am concerned about the FAR. I could go funny stories. The FAR is what I'm concerned about. Well, don't quote me on that. <laughs> <laughs> but in theory, it's about FAR, it's not about height. I've always had a problem with our, our, our box that we put developers in, in terms of build out to here, build out to here, build up to here, and you get no public space, you get no creative, uh, interesting architecture, you get no um, variations in the design. You get sausages and meat, block to block. I'm more interested in FAR, and um, what heights come out of that, I don't want to prejudge that. Because I agree, you do get more views if you actually go up uh, than out. But if you go out and up, you, you're not achieving your goal. So I'm more concerned with that there. Yes, I want to make that comment too. I think we're going to get feedback about the height, but I am more concerned about the FAR. And I think and we should say what FAR is, just the public may not understand FAR. Sorry. It's a floor area ratio. It's essentially taking your commercial and residential units, not the parking, not the corridors uh, and the open space. It's just the livable or habitable spaces and laying them out on the property. So if you have a property and you cover it off with just residences, just units, no corridors, no parking, that would be one, that one level. Uh, and it, obviously once you start introducing parking and hallways, um, it's it's not exactly a one-to-one -one ratio. So I think for me, this has a lot of really positive things going for it. So a four-story commercial, I think, is really excellent. I think the idea of closing off Main Street and connecting the park and making that a pedestrian sort of plaza, I think, makes sense to me. Um, but I think that we're not, like staff have said, we're not creating enough of activation throughout the whole site. It's still very dense. So, um, but although I'm, I'm not too concerned about Boggs Lane, I'd rather see better amenities on the ends and through the middle and around Cleveland and just make sure Boggs Lane looks nice. Hi, just to use the same example that was used by the previous speaker. So, you have a building this way going out, and you have a building going this way going up. Um, we're building, if we're building a building in height, we're building only on half of the Squamish Valley, basically, because the whole valley is not being developed um, in, in comparison to using the Vancouver, take a walk in Vancouver, and there's lots of open spaces. So you're basically looking at a small area strip that will be densified with higher buildings, like eight stories. Um, and I guess that's my point. Um, the analogy or, or the usage of, of taller buildings in this small strip um, will not really allow everyone to look at the Squamish Chief, which is a limited entity that is a second largest in the world entity over a small distance to look at it, to actually view it in angles. So you have to do the physics on this. So we're talking about a different situation here in Squamish as opposed to Vancouver. And that is my point. Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, any other questions or comments on the council? That's all out. Okay. Um, all right. Well, thank you.
Thanks very much. Thank you. Motion to terminate the meeting. Moved by Mayor Heitzman, seconded by Council Kent. Orders in favor? 